All right. Whoa. How's it going, guys? I'm so, by the way, happy to be back here. I was studying this afternoon, and I was like, oh, I don't like being gone. I mean, I like being gone, but yeah, cool. Um, Okay, so tonight I'm going to jump right in here because, as usual, I have a lot of notes and not a lot of time. So uh, if you got your Bible, if you have your Bible, if you got your Bible, my English teacher mother is rolling her eyes. Um, If you have your Bible, go to 1 John, and we're going to continue in 1 John chapter 2 tonight, right after we pray. I um, want to say thank you to Tej for last week, Tej, TJ, for last week teaching. Um, good stuff. I listened to it, and it was good. Uh, I like the fire line stuff. Good, good stuff. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the last few weeks, even on Sundays, like people are being prayed for and things are happening, and it's really, really awesome. So that was good stuff last week. So let me pray for us tonight, and then we'll dig in tonight. We're going to go all over, so get ready, all right? God, thank you for... Uh, an opportunity again to open your word and to um, feed our souls from what you uh, gave to man so long ago, God, to inspire them uh, to write down what you were saying. I pray tonight that as we study your word, as we study more of First John, that you would just speak to us, that you would um, convict us where we need to be convicted, you would challenge us where we need to be challenged, and you would love us where we need to be loved. I pray tonight as we study that Uh, We would find something new for each of us here tonight. And then as we pray tonight, I just ask Holy Spirit that you would come, you'd be here, and uh, that we would see, even even tonight, um, the things we pray for, see you begin to change uh, and miracles happen and see you do awesome things in this place. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight, 1 John chapter 2, we're going to talk on the topic of how do you know that you know God? I actually wanted to say, how do you know that you know that you know God? (laughs) Because you can just keep going over and over, right? How do you know that you know God? And we're going to look at 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 3. And it says this. We know that we have come to know him, speaking of God, of Jesus, if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word... God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we know him, or I'm sorry, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. These three simple verses, I think, are filled with a ton of depth. As I started studying this afternoon, I picked up uh, First John 2, and I just started reading verse 3, and I spent the majority of my time studying right on verse 3, because I don't know about you, but I want to know that I know God, and I don't want to know that I know him simply just to say that I know him, but I want to know him in a way that I live out what he commands me to do. And so we're going to look for a few minutes at the beginning here tonight about how do we know that we know God. And as we've talked about in the last few weeks as we've been studying First John, the three questions that we've learned over the last year to ask is what is the context, what is the writer's intent, and then how do we apply this passage to our life. The context really hasn't changed because we're in First John, so it's still John writing to the church globally and talking to them about their love and their heart for God. Uh, the writer's intent with this passage, I would say, goes right down immediately out of verse 3, is to know that you know God so that you follow what he says to do. And as you'll see tonight as we pick up some of these verses, how important God sees us knowing him as even more important than we might see us knowing him. And how seriously he takes it when we act like we know him, but we don't actually know him. So turn over in your Bible tonight to John chapter 10. And we are going to read... A lot of scripture here tonight. I'll wait. I'll wait for you, Alex. <laughs> We're going to read a lot of this. We're going to read um, 20 verses here. So look at John chapter 10, starting in verse 22. This is talking about how we know, or Jesus talking to us about how we know him. Uh, Starting in verse 22, it says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem, 
it was winter, which is important that we know that, I guess. And Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews, okay, that's why it's important to know it's winter, just a little FYI, because he was walking and it was cold. Okay, I don't know if that's true or not. I just made that up. The Jews gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Again the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered, it is not Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what my father does. But I do it even though you do not believe me. I believe the miracles that you may, I'm sorry, I believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the, and I in the father. Again, they tried to seize him. So they went to stone him, then they went to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. And here he stayed. And many people came to him They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. In John 10, we find a really interesting scenario going on where Jesus is telling the Pharisees who he is, telling the Jews who he is, telling the people gathered around him who he is. And they're asking him, it's hilarious to me, they're asking, who are you? And he's telling them who he is, and then their response is to say, well, you actually aren't, so we're going to stone you, and you're actually blasphemy. But they just asked him who he was, and his response they didn't like because his response to them was, how can you, a man, be God? Well, how he, a man, could be God was because from the beginning, or from Old Testament prophets, they had prophesied that eventually a Messiah would come into the world who would be fully God and fully man, but they didn't actually believe he was who he said He was. But I love in the very first part when Jesus starts talking in verse 25, and he says, I did tell you, but you did not believe me. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. One translation says, my sheep know my voice. It's interesting we're saying, how do we know that we know God? You know God when you know his voice. But what I want us to see tonight as I was studying this this afternoon is sometimes we can think we know God. Sometimes we think we know his voice and we live out of a place that says, I know God because I want everyone around me to think I know God. And we get real haughty, right? We get real like, oh, look at me. I know God. And what he's saying here is that you didn't even believe through the miracles I did, which is interesting if you contrast that over to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. I'm trying to build something here. Matthew 7, verse 21. So Jesus is talking about the miracles that he did, but he's saying what's important is not the miracles that I did. What's important is the people that know me know my voice, and that's how they know, know me, not from what I do. And just to back that up and give, I like giving context to what we're studying because it, the, the beauty of God's word as you're studying it out is seeing how it lines up to itself over and over again. So Matthew chapter 7, look at um, verse 21. Jesus is talking here and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. That passage of scripture convicts me so much. Because I think sometimes in a church, and especially what we do on Sundays, you want to see lives transform, you want to see miracles, you want to see people that get set free, you want to hear the success stories, right, of people that have had breakthrough in their life. But that verse is scary. Because what Jesus is saying, this is before this happens where they're questioning who he is, he's telling them, look, you can say you know me, and even the name of Jesus has so much power that you can do miracles in that name and still not know me. That's scary to me. The fact that you can use his name, and because and, the Bible says in the name of Jesus, every demon has to flee, that strongholds are broken, that, that, that we overcome. And so you can use that name and watch God do things, which is crazy, but it answers a lot of questions for me. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I'm kind of skeptical uh, I'm not skeptical of God, but I'm very skeptical of his people <laughs> a lot of times. And, and you'll watch ministries that flourish and are doing incredible things, and then you hear about the leader, and it's absolutely, like, insane, the life they're living. And I always watch those people, and I'm like, God, why are you blessing those people? It's not necessarily that he's blessing their people, and not that I'm saying who he blesses and who he doesn't. But I think when you watch... Certain people that just seem to have miracle after miracle, but their lives are absolutely horrible and they're mean people and they're not like Christ. It's not necessarily that God is putting his hand on that ministry as much as they have accessed the power in the name of Jesus, but they don't even know him. And so on earth, you can do all these miracles, which is great, and people get healed and we see all this awesome stuff, but if you don't know God, <coughs> excuse me, you don't actually you're not actually taking part in his kingdom. That to me is like, whoa. Which goes back then to John 10, how do you know that you know God? It's by hearing his voice and listening to him. And then in 1 John 2 where we started, it's obeying his commands. And so I was reading earlier today out of a, uh, just an expert excerpt out of a book written by... Um, J.I. Packer, and he is a theologian that works in, uh, over in Europe as, um, he's a professor of theology at Regent College in, um, over in Europe, and he is uh, writing this book called Knowing God, and so I was just reading excerpts of it, and I'd love to read the whole book, but I'm not going to do that because we'll be here all night, but I want you to listen to this where he's talking about knowledge, because I want to get at tonight about knowing, the root word of knowledge is know, Right? But sometimes when we're focused on how do I know God, we get so obsessed with knowing because we don't want to be the people that God says, I don't know you, right? We don't want to just perform miracles. We want to be people who see God do the miraculous, but we don't want to only do the miraculous and then not know God because what's the point? And so he's talking about knowledge and learning who God is and what God says. Listen to what he says. He says, for this very reason, we need, before we start to ascend our mountains, he's talking about our mountain of knowledge, which is so intriguing, to stop and ask ourselves a very fundamental question, a question indeed that we always ought to put ourselves wherever we embark on any line of study in God's holy book. The question concerns our own motives and intentions as students. We need to ask ourselves, what is my ultimate aim and object for occupying my mind with these things? What do I intend to do with my knowledge about God once I have it? For the fact that we have to face is this. If we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it is bound to go bad on us. It will make us proud and conceited. The very greatness of the subject matter will intoxicate us, and we shall come to think of ourselves as a cut above other Christians because of our interest in it and grasp of it. And we shall look down on those whose theological ideas seem, uh, seem to us crude or inadequate and dismiss them as very poor specimens." For as Paul told the conceited Corinthians, knowledge puffs up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. 
He goes on and he says, so to be preoccupied with getting theological knowledge as an end in itself, to approach Bible study with no higher a motive than to desire to know all the answers, is the direct route to a state of self-satisfied self-deception. We need to guard our hearts against such an attitude and pray to be kept from it. Isn't that good? That we can look at out for knowledge simply for the sake of knowledge because we have a heart that says, I want to know God, but we really, in our hearts, don't want to know God as much as we want to impress people with how we think we know God. And so I love to throw myself under the bus because I feel like, I, I feel like sometimes as a pastor, you think that like, we don't make mistakes. I mean, I know you guys, you know I do because I talk about it all the time. But I was thinking today about a story of, of when in my life I have like really been puffed up, and uh, Tej is back there, but Tej and I uh, grew up doing Bible quizzing. We were Bible quizzers, which, do you know what Bible quizzing is? It's amazing. So you get these seats, and it doesn't work if you're a husky boy. That's what they called me. We didn't use the word fat. We were husky. And so you have these seats, and you're like this, and, and they're, they're lower to the ground because you have these things you're sitting on. And then when the, the quiz master asks their questions, they like ask a question out of what you're studying in the Bible, and you have to jump to answer the question. Well, because I was a husky boy, I could never, ever answer a question because I couldn't get off the seat faster than the jocks. And so they're like, boom! And I'm over here kind of like, you know, because I was a husky boy. And so anyways, we did Bible quizzing, and I actually loved Bible quizzing because it taught me a lot about the Bible. But what I realized as I started getting older is I had a whole lot of knowledge of the word. Like I could quote you chapters of the Bible. And I, mean, I can still do it here today. I'm not saying that arrogantly because, they, because we knew all this stuff, right? I knew, I could quote you almost the whole book of James. Like that's what we knew, that's what we studied. And it's so great because God's word doesn't return void and it gets down in you and you know his word and you have the knowledge but you can have the knowledge and not truly know God. And I don't think I was ever at the point where I didn't know God as far as like as my personal savior. If I die, go to heaven, not that. But I think what I did is I let his word become my like um, almost the thing to repel people, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so people would come to me with questions or issues. And instead of responding like Christ did, because when you know Christ, you know his response is always love. My response would be, well, the Bible says this, 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 this. And instead of helping that person guide them towards God and towards his word, it would actually repel them away because the knowledge that I had, instead of taking that knowledge and applying it to how much more can I know God and hear his voice, I used it as a, a place to how do I tell you how much I know about God? And, and it feels cool when you grow up in church, especially because you want to look like you know, right? But you really don't know. You just know words and you, and you give lip service. But do you actually know down in here what God is saying? And so for me, one of my things I think I would say is a conviction in my life over and over is, is especially as a pastor and someone that teaches every week, is do I know this just to know this or am I actually living this out in my life? And only God can answer that. You can look at my life and say, well, I think based on what I see, it looks like you do that. But you don't really know. Only God really knows. And that's really what matters because when I stand before him, he's going to say to me, either well done or depart, I never knew you, regardless of how big of a church we grew, regardless of how many kids we helped, regardless of what we build together. At the end of time, it's not going to matter. God's going to go, but you didn't know me. That's freaky to me. And I think it's something that God takes very Seriously. And so if you look back uh, to 1 John, go back to 1 John, that's just verse 3. Going on to verse 4, and I promise you it's not all going to be bad tonight. There's going to get to the good part. We just got to get there. But verse 4 then says, The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoa. If you claim to know God, but you actually don't. You lie, and the truth is not in you. I was thinking this afternoon about lying because God takes lying seriously. And I was looking in Acts. If you go over to Acts chapter 5 real quick. I think tonight these are, these are uh, what I love about studying is that it gives us topics for what to pray for in our own lives because 
we can get convicted and go, oh man, God, do I really know you as I say I know you? Look at Acts chapter 5. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you didn't receive for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young man came and came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to be buried. It goes on, and his wife comes in, and the same thing happens with his wife. And she was in cahoots with her husband, and they had decided they were going to lie to everyone about what they're doing. This is interesting, because this is Acts chapter 5. And in Acts chapter 2, they were all devoted, it says in the end of Acts chapter 2, the early church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. And everyone sold their possessions and gave to each other so that none of them had need. And so that's going on in the camp at this point in Israel. And this couple comes and says, okay, we have, be- we have what God has given us, but we are not going to give it. We're going to keep it for ourselves. And the result is they die. Which is, this is New Testament. This isn't just Old Testament, right? Like, we talk about God, you know, people died in the Old Testament. This is New Testament. And so you look at that and you go, well, that's really harsh. Yeah, it is really harsh. But as I was studying that today, I thought, you know what? It's right in line with everything that we've talked about the last few weeks with 1 John when we we contrast back to James. And we talked about that cycle of temptation to desire to sin to death. That their haughtiness of saying, well, I know God and you think I know God. I don't actually have to do what God says, right? I can act like I know it on the outside, but lie to myself and lie to the Holy Spirit, it says, on the inside. That's that temptation that led to desire. Then that desire led to sin when they just said, nope, I'm not gonna give what God told me to give. And the sin led to death. It's like God works in these patterns where he says, look, I have created the way I do this and I line up the way I've lined it up, but if you don't do it the way I've called you to do it, you won't have my best in your life and what will happen and the result is death. Now today, you don't see many people that get just knocked down, right, and die. I know some of you wish there's some people around you that just get knocked down and die. I know, I know, I'm real, I get it. But, but, but the reality is it's that cycle spiritually in our life, right? If I'm tempted to not tell the truth, or maybe not even live in my real authentic self, right? It's easy when you have a microphone to act like you're somebody you're actually not, and then go home and behind closed doors be a wholly different person. That's a temptation we all have no matter what we do in life. But especially when you're on a platform, you can be up here and be all amazing, and then you get home and you're exhausted and your attitude's terrible, right? And you treat your wife and your kid bad. Just saying, right? When I do that, I've got the knowledge that puffs me up but I don't have the knowing of who God is in living out the character of who he is. And God takes it seriously. In fact, in Philippians chapter two, you don't have to turn there, but it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in, um, there's a word I'm missing there. But basically he says, consider others above yourself. And I think the whole thing that John's trying to get to here about how do you know that you know God, it comes down to, if you, do, if you know who God is and you hear his voice, like he says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice, and you know that it's not about what you do, it's about knowing him, then what he's getting at here is when you know him, you will live like he lived and you will do what he calls us to do. And what he calls us to do is always put others before ourself. And if you look at the root of all sin, there's a selfishness in us that we can cover up with our knowledge, Right? I know what God says, so I can just tell you what he says and do what I want to do, which is really considering myself better than you and not putting you above myself. And so in 1 John 2, he comes back and he says, so if you claim to know God, but you don't do what he says, you're a liar. But then we go on to verse 5, and I'm going to wrap this up so we can pray. Verse 5 and 6, this is where we have the but line. I love the but line in the Bible. I, teach, I taught about it a couple months ago on a Sunday, but I love the, when you, whenever you see the word buts in there, it's like 
here's the bad news, but here's the good news. For the wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by his grace. And so what I love about this is he's like, if anyone obeys his, or if, I'm sorry, if, if you claim to know him, but you do not do what he commands, you're a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walks. God's love is made complete in us. Why? Because if you truly know God and love him and desire to do what he says, you're not acting out of selfish motives, but out of a heart of putting others before yourself. And so he says, if you do that, you will walk as Jesus walked. So how did Jesus walk? I feel like that's a question that we could sit here all night and talk about. I just wrote down some ideas today of how Jesus walked. He walked in love with the woman at the well. A woman who was a Samaritan who he shouldn't even be an associate, he shouldn't have even been associating with, if you read in John chapter four, and she's there and he says, Will you give me water? And 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 she's and or he says, Will you um I'm getting confused now. Basically, he asks her for water, and then she says something about the water that he has, and he says, look, the water that I can give you will quench your thirst forever, and begins to tell her about who he is. He basically presents the gospel to her, and she believes and goes back and saves the whole community because of it. He walked when he healed the blind man, and he took the mud, and he put it on his, on his eyes, and the guy could see. He walked when the woman caught in the act of adultery was about to be stoned, and he looked at the guy stoning her and said, where are you? like who, whoever is without sin, you cast the first stone. And they knew they were in sin, so they walked away. He walked when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he walked on water, when he raised the dead girl, when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. But if you look at the root of everything he did and how he walked, the root of it was it was never on himself and always focused on others. And so ultimately, how did Jesus walk? It ultimately comes down to love. And this is where I want to end for us tonight. Is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a very familiar pack, passage. But I think it summarizes for us everything we talked about. Because what it says in verse 1 is, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. Right from the beginning, what he's saying is, look, if I do the miracles, if, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm so filled with the Spirit that I sit around speaking in tongues all day long, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm on the worship team and I'm the one that's just declaring worship and it's just amazing and people are getting healed and delivered and set free all around me, but I walk off the platform and I have no love, I'm nothing. Just like Jesus said, I never knew you. Yeah, you did all this because my name is powerful and you can use my name to do it, but I didn't know you. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. What's so cool about 1 John chapter 2, in contrast to if you know God, you'll do what he commands, is that what God is in his DNA is love. And everything we studied out tonight in the last half hour is all to lead to this one point that says if we truly are going to walk like God, we have to walk in love. And love always chooses others over ourselves and not our puffed up knowledge of what we know about love, but actually the action of living out a life like Christ lived out. And so if you want to write a couple things down, I try to give you guys some tips to write down before we pray tonight. A couple things you want to write down tonight. One is that knowing God 
is less about what you know and more about what you do with what you know. Knowing God is less about what you know and more about what you do with what you know. The second one tonight is that we don't memorize the word for the sake of memorizing the word. We do it to know God and how to live out what he desires. It's like that story I told about myself. I was at a place in my life where I just memorized it to say I memorized it. I can quote the book of James. What can you do? Right? I, I, and I was that kid. Oh, you listen to all that secular music? I can quote the Bible. I'm more holy than you, right? We don't do it for the sake of memorizing it. We do it to know God and how to live out what he desires. And the last one is that our motivation for knowing God needs to come from a pure heart set on him and not on how others will view that knowledge. It really comes down to the motivation of our heart. How do we know that we know God? We look at our life and say, how am I living? And so tonight, as we go into a time of prayer, I want to just challenge you when you're praying personally. There's a lot of stuff to pray for within the church. There's stuff to pray for, I'm sure, within your families. But before we do that, I want to challenge you to just for the first few minutes as the music comes on, to just seek God however you want to do it. If you want to walk around, you want to pray, you want to kneel, you want to whatever, come to the altar. But to seek God, to say, God, does my life reflect the love of Christ? And I'm not saying this to make you go, oh, no, it doesn't. If it doesn't, then just say, God, let my life reflect the love of Christ. There's no condemnation. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel and grace. There's no condemnation if you're in Christ. But, but if you can check your life and go, God, am I reflecting your love the way you designed it to be? Or am I just at a place in my life where I know a lot? And that's why I can say this on a Tuesday night. On, on a Sunday morning, we, people that, that, that are listening online or hear you guys here tonight, like, you know God. You don't come to church in the middle of the week if you don't want to know God, right? Just being real, right? So, but, but the thing is, sometimes that's, we're the people that we struggle with the most because we know the word. We, we're the ones up studying it, right? Everybody else is out partying and we're like, I'm in the word. I, I got this and it's, and it's got me. I'm, I'm, I, I know it. But I can know it and not know him. And so I think our prayer for tonight as we start praying is God, how teach me how to love like you love so I can walk like you walk so that way I know that I really know you the way that you've called me to know you. So let me pray for us and then we'll keep on praying tonight. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word does bring us knowledge, but it doesn't bring us knowledge so we can praise the knowledge we have. Your word brings understanding and knowledge so that we can live lives that bring you glory and love everyone around us. So I pray tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would come in this place, that you would just start speaking to each of us on areas in our life where we're not loving like Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to be people who walk like you walked, to love like you love, to put others before ourselves and never behind ourselves or under ourselves, but to love you in such a way that we live from a place of love so we can be like John talks about in 1 John, people who say we know that we know God because we do what he says to do. And I thank you tonight for speaking to us and continuing to speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray.